Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, we're just waiting for our next witness to... Yeah, that's fine. Attend. So our next witness is Mr. Jerem. Please could the witness be sworn. I'd just like to take that, thank you, and repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. For the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Please sit down. Please give your full name. Sorry. Please give your full name. Peter Ernest Jerome. Um, <coughs> Mr. Jerome, you should have in front of you a witness statement dated the 6th of August of this year. Yes. Is that right? Um, the statement runs to nine pages. Um, could I ask you please to turn to page eight of that statement? Yes. Um, do you see your signature there? I do, yes. At the bottom of the statement. Um, is the content of the statement true to the best of your knowledge and belief? Uh, yes, there are, I've got one comment on it, though, if that's okay. In section 15, when I read that again, um, when it says in there about the cash account, and I made a statement saying, and cannot therefore comment on whether there were issues. Uh, I was talking about issues that we didn't know about in my, in my role and supporting the end-to-end -end and MOT, I did know about issues that were found and then resolved. Which wasn't sure that was clear on that statement. So it, what you're saying, your evidence is that at, at paragraph 15 of your statement, you were saying that you were not aware of issues of which you were not aware. Is, is that, in effect, your correction? I guess so, <laughs> yes. This, this implied that I didn't know about anything. And we did have issues, and we did correct issues, so. Thank you. I'm going to begin uh, by asking you some brief questions about your recruitment uh, by ICL Pathway. Um, you joined ICL Pathway as a release project manager um, in approximately 1997, is that correct? Yes. Um, at that stage, you were not an employee of ICL Pathway. Correct. Um, but you have been recruited um, to join the program via an IT consultancy. Is that right? Yes. Um, you later became an, a permanent employee uh, of what became known as Fujitsu Services Limited in or around April 2003. Is that yes. right? Yes. Um, you remain employed by Fujitsu um, today, is that yes. correct? Yes. Um, but not on projects related to Horizon, I understand. No. Um, it is in your capacity as a current employee of Fujitsu uh, who had direct involvement in the matters uh, to which this inquiry relates, uh, that you were invited to provide a witness statement to the inquiry on behalf of Fujitsu, is that right? Yes. Um, the purpose of that statement uh, was to assist the inquiry with the matters canvassed in um, two Rule 9 requests. The first dated the 11th of March of this year, is that correct? Um, yes. Uh, and the second, the 1st of July. Okay. Um, those requests covered a, a range of issues, uh, which included um, issues identified in the development of the cash account function in Horizon, and you've, you've referred uh, just now to paragraph 15 of your statement, yes. uh, which was directed at that, um, as well as the accuracy and integrity of the data recorded and processed on the Horizon system, um, and the extent to which deficiencies uh, with Horizon were capable of causing apparent discrepancies um, or shortfalls in branch accounts. So those were three areas <coughs> canvassed in those requests, were they not? Uh, sorry, I don't remember the detail of the request. I, I was certainly asked some questions which I answered. 
bearing in mind what you've um, just told us about paragraph 15 of uh, your statement, do you consider you've been candid um, in your statement to the inquiry about your knowledge of technical issues with Horizon at the time? I would say I remember more now from the bundles that have been provided than maybe I did at the time of the statement. Before you finalised your statement, you were invited um, to refresh your memory from the contemporaneous records held by Fujitsu, were you not? Uh, I was certainly given some documents to r remind myself on things, yes. Um, you had access to all of the documents in Fujitsu's possession, did you not, that were relevant to your involvement? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I was certainly had access to some documents that were provided to me, yes. Did you ask to be provided with all documents that were relevant to your involvement in the period prior to the rollout of Horizon? When I had some questions on things, I asked and was provided with a document, yes. Um, I wonder if you could help us then. How is it that um, you came not to mention um, the issues that you, you say you've now come to understand and the recent disclosure that's been provided to you? Um, it's more of a case of reading the wording that I put in there. Because, for example, I got involved in the end-to-end -end testing and the model office rehearsals and testing with post office. And, and through that, there would have been incidents that were raised on the cash account and incidents that were cleared. So I would have had the visibility of those taking place at that time. You specifically mention in your statement um, at paragraph 26 um, that you were aware of a number of formal internal audits of the Horizon system. Is that correct? Yes. Did you ask to see copies of those audit reports before finalising your statement? Yes, I did see some. Um, we'll return to some of those um, a little later. In your role as release project manager, I understand you were responsible uh, for project managing the release of software by ICL pathway into the live estate. Is that correct? Yes. Um, you've explained in your statement that this was not a technical role so far as you were concerned. Yes. Um, and that you relied on those who did have the relevant technical expertise to bring technical matters to your attention. Is that right? Yes. Um, you've also stated you were not directly involved on the technical side of um, the development of the project, that's right? Yes. Um, you were, however, notified of significant technical developments and issues which affected the timing um, and release of software, is yes. that correct? Um, presumably knowledge of such technical issues would have been critical for you to perform your role as, as a project manager. To a certain level, yes. Um, though not a technical expert, um, you presumably had quite a high level of understanding of the purpose and function of the key components of Horizon. Is, is that correct? Probably at that time, yes. Um, you would have known, therefore, but please correct me if, I, if I'm assuming too much, but um, I presume you would have known that, that the electronic point of sales service, one of the key uh, components of the Horizon system, was responsible for recording and processing all of the transactions carried out within the post office branch by customers uh, purchasing goods and products of the post office, is that right? Yes. You would have known it was responsible for, for balancing receipts and payments? Yes. And for producing what was known as the cash account? Yes. Is that right? Um, and presumably you knew that the, that the essential function of the cash account uh, was to produce the definitive weekly summary of all the transactions recorded uh, within the post office branch? Yes. and that the cash account function therefore served uh, an essential accounting function both for the post office and for its agents who were using the system. Yes. Um, I'd like to ask you some questions about a report which was produced um, in September 1998 on completion of what was known as the EPOS Pinnacle Task Force. Um, the report to which I'm referring bears the unique reference number FUJ 0008069 um, You've had an opportunity to read this report, have you? Yes. Um, do you recall being shown a copy of this report 
at or around the time it was produced in September 1998? No. Were you aware uh, in the summer of 1998 that the volume of pinnacles recorded against the horizon product was very high? Uh, timing, not sure, but yes, I know there were lots of pinnacles at some stage. Did you know at the time that the pinnacle count was sufficiently high um, that the task force had been established in an effort to reduce it? Yes, I think I do. Uh, were you made aware uh, on completion of the task force about the concerns which had been expressed by those um, with the relevant technical expertise about the quality of the EPOS code? There was certainly a discussion about uh, yeah, the quality of the product. Was um, that a discussion that you had in one of the development directors' meetings which you attended with Terry Austin? Probably. Um, what exactly did you understand to be the nature of the concerns about the quality of the EPOS code? With the large number of pinnacles that had been raised through the testing services. Uh, and that indicated what, as you understood that the, it? The product was of questionable quality. Were you aware that um, the, uh, those with relevant technical expertise had expressed fears that um, the application of pinnacle fixes was likely to lead to yet further degradation of the quality of the EPOS code? Whether aware at the time that that would be a risk with the number of changes that were being made. So that was something of which you would have been aware at the time? Yes. You um, mentioned, uh, when confirming the content of your statement, that you, you had some oversight um, of uh, model office and end-to-end -end testing, is, is yes. that right? Um, we know that you participated in a review um, in early December 1998 um, of the pinnacles raised during what was known as MOR3 um, and end-to-end -end testing, which had been carried out in November of that year. That's right, isn't it? Yes. Um, yeah. um, you've been shown a copy of the memorandum that was produced by Andrew Simpkins on the 4th of December of 1998 um, in connection with that review, have you not? I've looked at all the things sent to me, so that was one of them, yes. Um, the document to which I'm referring is POL 0028429. Please. We can see that you're named as um, one of a number of recipients of that memorandum. Yes. You not? Um, ha have you taken the opportunity to refresh um, your memory of the document? Uh, this particular one versus the others. I can't remember what, exactly what this one said. Um, the memorandum canvases um, a number of issues um, that were identified during the review. Um, if we could scroll down, excuse me, please, to um, the first page, a little bit lower on the first page. Um, under the heading Progress this week, um, Mr Simpkins confirms, um, as you are aware, Horizon, TIP, which would be Transaction Information Processing and Pathway, have carried out a comprehensive and detailed analysis this week of pinnacles arising from MOR3 and E2E. Um, end to end, uh, so there's two testing cycles, is that right? Yes. In brackets, and outstanding faults from previous phases. We would like to thank Peter Jerram for his active support to this review. I attach a copy of the summary totals and the full pinnacle analysis pack. Um, if we go on a page, please, to the second page. Um, under the heading testing issues, um, it reads, since tabling the paper on the key problem area analysis at the checkpoint meeting on the 18th of November, good progress has been made on most of the nine areas identified. We will reissue this summary next week showing the current action points. Specific concerns that have been confirmed by the Pinnacle Review include, and then we can see a list of issues, um, firstly those on the transaction information processing interface, these include um, inconsistencies 
between the transaction file totals and the cash account. That's the third bullet point. Can you see that? Yeah, I wouldn't have been involved in the, the detail of these things. My, the action I was doing was making sure there was a review and that everybody was being very open in sharing them. Well, we can see you, you participated in that review yep. uh, and Mr Simpkins expressed his thanks to mm -hmm. you for assisting. But it wouldn't have been my thanks from uh, diagnosing the issues or the things. Oh, no, I, forgive me. I, I'm not suggesting that you would have had a detailed technical awareness of the underlying causes of these issues. Yep. Um, but you would have been aware, surely, by virtue of that review and the receipt of this memo, that issues of this nature were being discussed at the yes. time in December 1990. Yes. So we have there at the third bullet point, inconsistencies between the transaction file totals and the cash account. At the fourth bullet point, lost BES, that'd be benefit encashment service transactions on the transaction file. Um, a little further down, um, there's reference um, under the heading on the counter to a number of incidents around stock unit balancing. Um, and then if we uh, scroll down a little further, please. Under the heading other issues, uh, we see a number of listed, the first of which are cash account uh, balances. Um, and there's reference there to a constructive joint meeting on the reasons for imbalances um, and the action being taken to address these. Yes. Um, so I think we're, we're agreed that in December 1998, these were all issues that were certainly on, your, on your radar. Yes. <laughs> you also knew, did you not, um, that there remained um, quite significant concerns about Horizon's accounting integrity at the point at which the system was accepted by the post office in late September 1999. I know, although I wasn't directly involved in the acceptance, I know there were issues that were uh, going through discussion, exactly. The concerns about um, Horizon's lack of accounting integrity were sufficiently serious at that stage, were they not, that ICL Pathway had agreed to produce a new piece of software to perform reconciliation checks. You were aware of that, were you not? Yeah, that was towards the end of... 2000, maybe? Oh, no, before, yeah, by the end of 99, yes, yes. Um, the purpose of that software, known as the Accounting Integrity Control Release, uh, was to detect cash account imbalances mm -hmm. uh, and to produce reports to enable them to be rectified. Is, yes. Is that not correct? Yes. Um, and you were, in fact, responsible for project managing the release of that piece of software. Were yes. You? Um, we can see that um, if we pull up document FUJ treble zero double one eight one five six, please. Uh, forgive me, it's uh, one five six, please. Thank you. I'm sorry, that was uh, reference error was my fault. Um, this is this document is described as a process release note. Mm -hmm. um, it's dated the 29th of October of 1999. We can see at the top it's version 0.1. It provides a definition of the CSR plus increment 2.2 relating to acceptance incident 376 release for Post Office Counters Limited. Yes. Um, a document that was reviewed by you mm -hmm. and to which you contributed at the time. Yes. Um, before uh, we move on, please, um, to uh, our, another topic, um, I'd be grateful if you could assist me um, with one further document. 
Um, this is document FUJ 00118175, please. Um, this is a document which was produced to the inquiry by ICL Pathway. Um, you've been shown a copy of this document, I believe. I have, yes. Um, have you taken the opportunity to read it? Uh, I have. I wouldn't say I fully understand it. but um, It's clear from its title that it relates to EPOS reconciliation issues and acceptance incident number 376. Yes. Um, there's an entry at the top uh, which indicates that comments have been added to the document by PJP. Can you help us? Don't think that's Is that me. a reference to you? When I read it, so I saw that, I thought that might be John Pope. Um, thank you. Um, I'd like now, if I may, please, um, to turn to the development audit of the Core System Release Plus, which was conducted in September 1999. Um, this was an audit carried out by uh, Jan Holmes, Pathway Audit Manager, who produced a report recording his findings in late October yes. of 1999. Um, you were made aware at the time of the findings of that audit, were yes. you not? Um, do you recall reading the audit report? <laughs> yes. Um, you've recently be been provided with a copy, um, and have you taken the opportunity to refresh your memory yes. of its content? Um, it bears the reference FUJ at 0079782, please. Um, have you read in particular the section of the report at pages 19 and 20, which address the author's findings in relation to EPOS? I've read the report, so I would have gone through that as well, yes. Whether or not, whether or not you were shown a copy of the report uh, into the EPOS Pinnacle Task Force in September mm -hmm. 1998, um, you would have known upon reading this audit report that the EPOS Pinnacle Task Force report had the previous year called into question uh, the maintainability and resilience of the EPOS code. Yes. Uh, and that was by reason of the high number of uh, Pinnacle fixes which had been applied to the EPOS product. That's yes. correct, isn't it? Um, what's more, you would have also known uh, on reading this report uh, that, that since completion of the task force, uh, nearly a thousand Pinnacles uh, had been raised against the EPOS product and that the application of fixes to address those faults uh, was bound to have worsened the quality of the code. There was that risk, yes. Um, Jan Holmes's concerns about the quality of the EPOS product were sufficiently grave that he recommended that, that consideration be given to redesigning or rewriting EPOS. Yes. You were aware of that. Yeah, I saw that in the report, yes. Um, this wasn't the first occasion on which um, that recommendation had been made, had it? Uh, I don't remember. Um, we know um, from reading this audit report um, that an earlier report addressing the quality um, of the EPOS product had been produced by Pathway uh, in, uh, on the 21st of September uh, 1999. Were you aware of that report? I don't know. And perhaps if we could turn to page two, please. If we scroll down, please. Thank you. Um, under the heading uh, 0.3 associated documents, there's a reference uh, at point seven to a report on EPOS solutions dated 20 excuse me, 21st of September, 1999. Were you aware of, of that report? I don't remember that report. Um, we see that report uh, referenced uh, in this audit. Mm -hmm. uh, if we could go to page 20, please. Um, in the box there, this, um, the audit states that the EPOS Solutions Report, which is document number seven in the associated documents we saw just a moment ago, made specific recommendations to consider the redesign and rewrite of EPOS in whole or in part to address the then known shortcomings. Um, so that recommendation was first made in, uh, on the 21st of September of 1999. Um, 
do you know whether or not a copy of that report uh, was provided to post office counters prior to their decision to accept the Horizon system in late September? I don't know. Do you consider that a copy of that report should have been provided to post office counters to inform their decision about acceptance of the Horizon system? I think so, along with the testing from it, yes. And who do you think uh, was responsible for ensuring that was done within ICL Pathway? Well, it probably would have been done through one of the reviews that Mike, Terry and I were at. Um, forgive me, but by reviews, do you mean in internal reviews? No, in the meetings we had with uh, Post Office. With Post Office? Yes. I don't, I don't think we did, but that, I guess, would be the place that it was shared. And that's where it ought to have been shared, is, is your view? Yes. When you received a copy of the CSR Plus development report um, in late October 1999, um, did you take any steps to bring its findings and recommendations to the attention of post office counters? I don't th remember doing so. Um, do you consider that a copy of the CSR development audit report should have been provided to post office counters to inform their decision about the resolution of acceptance incident number 376? I think we concentrated more on the testing that showed that it was working necessary than the report. Um, but as we had quite an open relationship, then I don't, I don't know why we wouldn't have shared it. So is, it your, is it your evidence that you think you would have shared it at the time? No, I, my evidence is I don't know. The um, CSR Plus development audit report was uh, supported by a schedule of corrective actions in which um, the recommendations resulting from the audit uh, were recorded and agreed corrective actions were documented. Were you aware of yes. that? Yes. Um, one of those recommendations we, we can see here uh, was that um, in light of the continued evidence of poor product quality, that is to say in the EBOS product, um, that the recommendations to consider the redesign and rewrite of EBOS be reconsidered. Um, so you were aware, were you not, that Jan, Jan Holmes had specifically recommended that, that that earlier recommendation be reconsidered? From reading this, yes, I'm sure at the time. Um, You've received a copy of the schedule of corrective actions um, that was circulated um, in late November. Uh, of, forgive me, you, at the time, you would have received a copy of the schedule of corrective actions. Yes. That's right. Um, for the benefit of the transcript, that document um, bears the reference FUJ 0079783. Um, you also received um, a copy of the um, revised schedule uh, in May 2000, is that right? Yes. Um, have you refreshed your memory um, of those documents from yes. the copies provided to you? Yes. Um, please could um, WITN 04600104 uh, be shown on the screen, please. So this is the um, this is version 2.0. Um, so the version dated 10th of May uh, 2000, um, and we can see you there named um, on the distribution list. Um, if we could please scroll down to page 10 of the schedule. <laughs> F, give me um, page nine, please. Under the heading uh, Report Observations and Recommendations, uh, we can see reference to uh, the recommendation to reconsider the redesign and rewrite of EPOS. That's right? Yes. Um, you're not the owner uh, of that action, and you're not um, named as one of the management team members. That's right, isn't it? Correct. Um, you were, however, vo involved um, in its resolution, were you not? Yes. 
we um, know from the entries um, in the agreed actions column, so the um, uh, second from the right, um, that Terry Austin um, had on the 15th of November uh, requested uh, that the recommendation to redesign and rewrite the EPOS application be closed, um, having concluded uh, that it would be difficult to justify the case for rewriting it. You were presumably aware of that, were you? Yes. Um, at the bottom of the page, we can see uh, that uh, Mr. Austin proposed continuing to monitor the pinnacle stack for the next few months to assess whether or not it was necessary to reevaluate that decision. Yes. Were you aware of that at the yes. time? Um, so essentially, subject to what the pinnacle stack showed, um, the recommendation was either going to be closed uh, or, uh, or indeed taken further. Yes. Um, if we scroll on, please, to page 10, uh, we can see two um, entries dated 8th of December of 1999. Um, one of these appears to relate um, to you. That's the, the second of those entries. Um, the first reads, um, JH requested statistics on fixes delivered to live from RM. Um, also informed TPA uh, that requires agreement of MJBC before this be closed. Uh, we understand the reference to JH to be Jan Holmes, the author of the report. Yes. Does that sound correct? Yes. Um, he'd requested statistics on fixes. Um, this is presumably a reference to statistics from release management. Is that right, RM? Uh, I was wondering if it meant that, but uh, it, it, it could do, yes. Um, and that would be fixes. Uh, that would be statistics relating to software fixes delivered to the live system. Correct. Is that, is that right? Um, or into the testing phases, ready to go to the live system. Um, we can see there that Jan Holmes has informed Terry Austin uh, that um, his instruction to close the recommendation, in fact, requires the agreement of the um, program director. Mike Coombs. Yes. That was correct, isn't it? Um, the second entry, dated the 8th of uh, December, uh, reads MJBC, which we know is Mike, Mike Coombs, confirmed that unless RM statistics contradicted reports provided by PJ, the recommendation could be closed. Um, so we know on the one hand there's this request for statistics from release management, um, but there's also a reference here to reports provided by you. Can you, can you help us, please? Yeah, well, it would be the same data. So I would have given input on pinnacles that have been closed or being addressed, and this is asking for confirmation that release management agree with the, the data that I had. Um, can I just clarify, you were, of course, the release project manager. Um, why would it be that, why might it be that there were contradictions between your reports and the statistics held by release management? No, there wouldn't be. The, right. But he's asked for, I think in that Mike is asking for the formalising release management providing the data that matches. Okay. Um, and that's to satisfy him yes. that it is indeed proper to close that action. Um, there appears then to be a gap um, of approximately four months and we see the next entry is dated the 7th of April of 2000. Um, can you see that? Yes. Um, in the meantime, um, concerns were raised with you in early January 2000 um, about an increasing number of pinnacles, cash account misbalances and reconciliation errors, were they not? I don't remember. Um, the, I'm not saying it didn't happen, but I don't remember. Um, I'm referring to um, emails uh, dated early January 2000, 
um, which bear the reference FUJ0079332. And please could that be shown on the screen. Um, the author of this email is a Duncan MacDonald. Hmm. Um, was he one of the technical um, experts on whom you relied to bring uh, technical issues to your attention? I don't remember Duncan. Typical. Um, the email's addressed to you. Um, we can see at the top there, it's dated the first of, um, uh, sorry, the fourth of January two thousand, I believe. Yes. Um, although quite possibly it could be the first of April. I'm conscious that some emails um, have the month first and the and the day um, second. But be that as it may, um, whether January or April. Um, we can see here um, the subject matter of the report is um, CI4 transaction mode problems. Yes. Can you see that? Yes. Um, I understand CI4 uh, was the name of a software release uh, relating to the EPOS application, uh, which was later introduced. I don't know if it was just EPOS, but I think it was a, an increment four to the core release. I think it was something like that. So it related to functionality yes. affecting EPOS and other components of this. Potentially, system. yes. Um, I think it, it follows um, that um, C14 um, had not, uh, I think, C, uh, sorry, not C14, uh, CI4 um, had not been released into the live estate at this stage, is that correct? I would read Taking this to be January or indeed April. Because it's talking about end-to-end -end systems, so I think it's having problems in its testing. We're in the testing phase. Yes. Um, and CI4 was um, part of the um, the larger release known as the Core System Release Plus. Was it, is that correct? To your uh, I don't know whether CI4 is part of that or whether CI4 was an increment to the release before that. Which the CSR? Yes. Okay. I think CSR Plus didn't happen until quite a bit later. Um, I think that was rolled out in the course of 2000, CSR Plus. Was it? Okay. We can check. Um, be that as it may, we're, yep. we're dealing here with issues identified in, in software testing. Um, and this email reads, um, we're getting an increasing number of pinnacles on the end-to-end -end system handling of the new CI4 transaction modes. These are described in brackets as PT, NAD, RIAD and ROAD leading to cash account misbalances and reconciliation errors. These pinnacles are generally being batted about between the different areas. I suggest a workshop is set up, led by either requirements or EPOS, to present the current end-to-end -end solution, identifying the problem areas, and then agree the, uh, the necessary changes to achieve a consistent solution. This may involve having to get clarification of requirements from post office counters limited. If anyone can think of a better approach um, or that there isn't a problem, please say so. Um, do you recall whether the proposal to set up a workshop, uh, whether or not that proposal was taken up? I would have thought so. It's quite a, uh, an obvious thing to be suggesting, and, and there were obviously work problems that needed to get together and work out what to do. Um, given that this software release CI4 um, related, at least in part, to the EPOS application. And it was known to be, uh, it was known to be, um, uh, there were known to be pinnacles causing cash account misbalances and reconciliation errors. Um, did this email cause you to um, consider uh, whether or not um, the outstanding recommendation to redesign and rewrite the EPOS application ought to be re-evaluated? I think well, following the workshop and, what's, and, and see what's happening in the testing, what's being found, would have led into that decision about how, how bad it was. But did this increasing number of pinnacles and the cash account misbalances it was causing not in itself um, call into question the early decision of Terry Austin to close the action? Depending on what was found through reviewing this, then that might have ultimately led to that. 
pathways concerns about the quality and stability of the Horizon software um, were issues of which you continue to have oversight in the spring of 2000, were they not? I think it was about this time that I changed my role. I was, I was asked to look after the development teams. Uh, there were some other uh, challenges. We put a corrective action plan in place on certain areas. I'm not sure whether I continued at that point to, to still be the, the sort of release project liaison or not. We can see um, you did have some oversight of these issues. Mm -hmm. um, you've been provided with a copy of ICL Pathways Consolidated Risk Register yep. um, covering the period of approximately May 1998 to May 2000. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Um, for the benefit of the transcript, that document um, bears the reference FUJ 000784. <coughs> um, apologies, we're just um, verifying a reference. Um, so I wonder if you'd mind if we take a short five-minute break um, to see if we can um, enable the document to be shown on the screen. Well, of course. Um, uh, just before we do that, um, Mr. Blake and I have been in email co communication about tomorrow, and am I right in thinking now that the witnesses scheduled for tomorrow are either not going to give oral evidence or be called at some future time? Um, so that's correct. Um, Mr. Jerome is our last evidence, uh, our last witness uh, for this week, and I certainly All right, would, would hope we can. I, I just want, I, I just wanted to say that publicly as quickly as possible, so that anybody listening would know that. So, at the end of this afternoon session, we won't be uh, convening tomorrow. We'll be convening next Tuesday. Thank you, sir. Yes. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Well, let me know when you're ready. Thank you. So thank you for the additional time. Uh, we've managed to display uh, the document to which I was referring a short time ago. Um, this is a uh, copy of the consolidated uh, risk register um, produced, by ICL, produced by ICL Pathway um, in the period May 1998 to May um, 2000. Um, what you can see, I hope, on the screen is page uh, four of that risk register, um, where two entries are recorded. Um, the first um, bears the reference 00, zero um, underscore 25. Um, that was a risk raised uh, in February 2000, of which Terry Austin was the owner. Um, under the heading uh, risk summary, um, it's described as um, a maintainability, uh, forgive me, um, that's the second of the two entries. The first is 00 underscore 38, um, also raised in February 2000, um, and of which Terry Austin was also the risk owner. Um, it's a risk in the area of development, uh, which bears the title maintenance activity. Um, for the benefit of the witness, if we could um, scroll, please, to um, the, the right-hand side, there are some further columns. 
um, at column N, uh, Mr Jaren, we see that you were the, the mitigation owner of that risk. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. Um, please could we scroll back um, so that we can see um, column G, which contains the risk description. Uh, we can see that provides that uh, maintenance effort over the life of the contract exceeds the planned levels. Analysis of call information and user problems necessitates research effort, diverting resources from development or pinnacle support work. Hence, pinnacle stacks remain high, still developing on age platforms, skilled and experienced staff increasingly being lost through attrition, no longer able to retain with prospect of developing new applications. And then under the column H, uh, we can see a description of the risk impact um, that provides uh, cannot retain experienced staff, cannot attract quality people, availability increased, person uh, availability increased personnel costs in development as staff are retained for maintenance, increased product support costs. Um, the following uh, three columns uh, contain an assessment of the probability, uh, the impact, uh, and then the factor of those risks. Um, the, prob the probability of um, that risk occurring is in relation to maintenance activity um, is recorded as being three. Um, do you recall that, Mr Jerome? I can, I can read it, yes. Um, the score of three, as I understand it, reflected a probability um, of 30 to 60 per cent of, of that risk occurring. Yes. Is that right? <coughs> yeah, I'm looking at the front page. Yes, agreed. Um, the impact of the risk we can see was scored um, as four, um, and that reflected um, a major change for approved costs, quality, timescale of some activity, which would cause serious delay. Is that right? Yes. Um, and that gives a factor score of 12. We can see that in column K. Um, under column L, we have a description of the mitigation action uh, for this particular risk. Thank you. Um, that reads, 8th of June, Investment Strategy Board need positive decisions on future opportunities. Post Office Counters Limited need to move away from move to the right culture to realise new business opportunities. Need to consider contingency plan, retaining maintenance team for bespoke software with further developments undertaken by large projects. Um, can you assist us, please, as the mitigation owner uh, with that entry? I think that mitigation is particularly towards the losing of the skilled resources that understood the products. Um, <clears throat> but the point that's being raised in the risk description is that if those skilled people are just, I'm not saying pinnacle fixing wasn't important, if they're just pinnacle fixing, then they might want to move on from supporting pathway. So that was about um, what were the next opportunities that would keep people interested in doing what they're doing today because there's something different in the future. Um, and the concern being expressed here, as raised in February 2000, was that the pinnacle stack remained high. That's what gave rise to this risk of attrition, is it, in relation to staff? Yeah, I mean, there was uh, obviously CR Plus taking place and there were service increments, so there will be continual testing and continual new pinnacles coming along. Um, and just for the benefit of, of the transcript, by, by maintenance activity, would I be right to understand that what this document's referring to is the identification and rectification of pinnacles, bugs, errors and defects in the system as and when? Yeah, it, it could be those that... Uh, were raised at the end of testing cycles that were uh, allowed to be there when we went live, or they could be coming from new changes being made, or they could be coming from the live service. Um, so a number of different domains, yes. um, creating pressures on your maintenance team. Yes. The um, second entry um, we see there at row 17, dated seven, uh, February 2000, um, is described as maintainability. Uh, Give me bears the heading maintainability, um, and is described in column G as a risk relating to the quality of software. 
It states products have grown organically so product stability is not assured. The risk impact reads that there's increased cost, operational system failures and reputation. Presumably that's, that's damage to the reputation of ICL pathway, is that right? Yes, and to reputation of the system. system. Um, the pro probability of that risk is assessed as two, um, which I understand to mean um, that it was considered to bear a, a 10 to 30% likelihood of eventuating, is that right? Yes. Um, and uh, it, it also carries the, the impact factor of, of four, at the same as the um, maintenance activity risk. Um, the mitigation action is simply to, to monitor issues in the live estate, is, is that right? That's what it says, yes. Do you recall your ownership of that mitigation at the time? Uh, well, that's not really much of a mitigation, really, in, in, in what I'm reading there. I mean, in parallel with this, we had a, a corrective action plan that was taking place um, that was a, a sort of quite a big exercise that was in place going back over uh, designs and software quality and things and, and, and sorting out across the estate the su supportability for the longer term of the Horizon product. Um, forgive me, can, can you assist us by, by a corrective action plan? Are you, are you referring to the the plan that we've seen already, or are you suggesting there's, there was another specific plan in place? Um, it Did came out with? from the audit, from the development audit, um, that we put a corrective action plan in place. And there was discussion about, at one point, what it was going to cost to do it, which wasn't a problem. Cost to do what, sorry? To do the work, the extra work. This is to say the, the maintenance work? Or the redesign? No, to do Im improving the documentation of the product that was being maintained. Uh, sorry, I, I don't entirely follow. Impro improving the documentation of the product. Are we referring here to design documentation? Are we Desi design and uh, test scripts for, for, for retesting, etc. And, and to which products are you referring? Uh, a number of different products, I think. Right. Um, and... Uh, forgive me, what we're dealing with here, I think, is issues in relation to the, the quality of the, the software. Yes. Uh, we don't see any reference to a corrective action plan here, do we? No. I, I, it's only that I know that that would have been happening around the same sort of time, but I'm surprised it's not there as a mitigation. Right. Sorry, that's my point. Um what emerges, I, th I think, from reviewing this risk register um, is that there remained um, significant concerns in the spring of 2000 um, about the quality of the Horizon software. Is that fair? Yes. Uh, and about the ability of ICL Pathway effectively uh, to maintain Horizon in the live estate. That was the risk that was being recorded, yes. Well, the, the, there was the risk of that. And as we can see, the probability that the view was it was a, a reasonably high probability. Um, I'd like to return at this point, please, to the schedule of corrective actions, which we um, reviewed a short time ago. Um, that's the document that bears the reference number WITN 04600104. Um, at page 10, please. Thank you. I forgive you, in, internal, it says page 11. Thank you. Um, there are three remaining entries um, in the right-hand column. Um, the first of these is dated the 7th of April, uh, by which I assume we're now into the year 2000. Um, that reads, email to MJBC, Mike Coombs, TPA, Terry Austin and PJ, which would be you, 
yes. providing details of RM EPOS fixes to live, so release management EPOS fixes to live, asked for confirmation that matched PJ reports. If does, then we'll close. Um, so it appears to show that Jan Holmes has, has obtained details of the RM, the release management EPOS fixes to live, and is seeking confirmation that these are matching your reports. Is that correct? Yes, I'm surprised it's four months later than the original entry, but if it's the same, that feels a bit out of date by then, but, but yes, what's implying, yes. I, I, I assume it's a, an updated position by the end of or beginning of April. But And that's dated 7th of April. Um, I think the document um, to which I referred you a short time ago, which I initially thought was dated January, um, was in fact dated um, the 1st of April. Um, perhaps if we could just um, pull that up again um, to ensure we have an accurate um, record on the transcript. Uh, um, that is um, FUJ treble zero seven nine um, double three two. Um, if I can just refer you um, back to the date, yes. it's recorded as sent 4-1-2000. Um, having looked at some of the other ICL pathway emails, um, it appears that they bear first the date, uh, the month, then the day, and the year. Um, I don't know if you can assist us with that, whether you, you think that is correct, that this would have been early April. I, I don't remember the dates being in American format, but I'm... Happy to accept. I've seen some that obviously are in American format. Um, thank you. Can we return, please, to the schedule of corrective actions, which is WITN 04600104. As you say, some, some time uh, has elapsed between the last entry on the 8th of December uh, and this further entry on the 7th of April. Um, the next entry, dated almost a month later, is the 3rd of May. Um, and this is uh, to record that a reminder email was sent to the above, by which I understand to mean to Mike Coombs, Terry Austin, and to you, uh, seeking early response chased on the same day. Does that um, assist you at all in your recollection of the, the, the progress of this action? No, but looking it through, it, it seems that for whatever <coughs> reason, it took Jan longer to get his data to confirm what I had said back in December. I presume the email was asking for Mike to confirm the position, and then Jan's had to chase it again. I'm, I'm guessing that's what happened. Do you, do you recall what your reports were? Um, at this stage in relation to the volume of EPOS fixes to the live estate? I, d I don't know, but it would have been based on, as I said, it had been the same data as release management would provide. It would have been the data around what pinnacles had been raised, were open and what had been closed. Um, bearing in mind the references we saw in, in the risk assessment, the risk register to pinnacles being high yeah. and to the concerns that were raised with you about the increasing number of pinnacles in CI4, um, is it fair to assume that you were likely to have been reporting that the pinnacles remained high at this stage? If I had reported again at that stage, I don't know that I reported since uh, the December position. I mean, there's, there's multiple versions of the product, so that CI4 recommendation is for a later, a later development stage of it, as opposed to pinnacles from earlier stages. So they're all going to start overlapping to a certain extent. But is it your overall recollection Pinnacles remained high at this time, in the spring of 2000? I think uh, volumes of Pinnacles continued for quite a while. By volumes, you mean...? Numbers, numbers being raised. High volumes? Yes. The final entry um, we have is dated the 10th of May... Um, this records a response received from 
um, Mike Coombs. Um, it reads, as discussed, this should be closed. Effectively, as a management team, we've accepted the ongoing cost of maintenance rather than the cost of a rewrite. Rewrites of the product will only be considered if we need to reopen the code to introduce significant changes in functionality. We will continue to monitor the code quality based on product defects as we progress through the final passes of testing and the introduction of the modified CI4 code set into live usage in network. PJ, which is presumably a reference to you, Mr. Jerem, um, can we make sure that this is specifically covered in our reviews of the B and TC test cycles? And the actions recorded as closed um, on the 10th of May. Um, just pausing there, the, the reference to the cost of um, maintenance, um, we've, we've already discussed what we understand by maintenance to be, but this is effectively the cost of um, continuing to rectify bugs, errors and defects in, in the yes. live estate and in testing. Um, can you explain, please, the reference um, at the very end to um, making sure that this is covered in our reviews of BNTC test cycles? Yeah, B BNTC is the... Uh, at this stage, it went through development testing into system testing and then BNTC, which I think was something like business and technical conformance test, something like that. Um, so what this is ensuring that the reviews of that, that we're monitoring what the pinnacle position that is coming out of those test cycles. Um, so as at 10th of May, the decision's ultimately been taken um, not to redesign or rewrite the EPOS code. That's correct. Yes. Um, it was a decision of the management team. Um, as release project manager, were you part of that team? Uh, I don't know what the team here would be, but if it's the management team, no. Um, but if it's the conversation about what we're doing with development, then I would have probably joined that conversation with Terry and Mike. Do you recall having input into the decision that was ultimately taken in relation to the closure of this no. action? Now, we, we know that um, it had been brought to your attention that there were increasing numbers of pinnacles, cash account, misbalances and reconciliations in the CI4 yes. testing. Um, were those matters which you were those matters which you had brought to the attention of your senior managers um, at the time that this decision was taken? Uh, it, yes, it would have been. It would have been known. When well, you say it, it would have been known, well, because th they'd have known about what's happening with CI4 at this point. If there were problems in the testing at the beginning of April then it would have been known by Terry and Mike. So at the time of taking this decision, it's your evidence that Terry Austin and Mike Coombs would have been well aware of those concerns which have been brought to your attention? They would have been known aware... Well, I don't know what it was like at the end of... or well, beginning of May, a month after Duncan raised that email. I don't know what happened during that month, whether after the reviews, etc., how it improved. Um, but that's probably why they're saying let's let's monitor us in the BNTC. And this decision was taken, notwithstanding the fact that there were serious concerns about ICL Pathways' ability effectively to maintain Horizon in the live estate. There right. were concerns raised in the research, yes. Did you consider at the time that this was the right decision to take? Uh, I would say yes. If I, if I didn't or hadn't of, then I would have raised my voice to make a point. So I must have agreed. Were you not concerned that the continued application of software fixes was likely to lead to a, a further degradation in the quality of the EPOS code? There was still a very large test team in place that were validating things and continually... Well, that's where the pinnacles were coming from. So continually checking and validating and, and improving the product. 
So it, it wasn't as if that exercise had stopped. You, you described that as an improvement of the product, um, but you were, you were aware, were you not, of a risk of code, what we call code regression? There's always that risk, yes. And what did you understand by that risk? That in changing a product, in, in an ideal world, once you've put something into a live estate, this never happens. You'd never, you'd never change it. Right? Whenever you change it, there is a chance that you'll have a code regression in it. That's why you continue your testing. So it doesn't follow necessarily that, that albeit you might improve certain aspects of the, of the software, you might cause yet further problems to be uh, to arise elsewhere. Yeah, and that's why you do regression testing. Was the likely consequence of code degradation caused by software, um, further software fixes, was that not likely to cause yet further problems such as cash count imbalances and reconciliation errors? There is that risk, but that's why you've got the regression testing. Having taken um, the decision not to redesign and rewrite uh, the EPOS code, um, ICL Pathway um, continued to apply fixes to the code as and when they were detected, did they not? Yes. Or, um, or as and when they were enhancing it for other reasons. Um, do you recall whether the number of pinnacles and fixes um, being applied in the summer and autumn of 2000 remained high or not? No, I'm sorry, I don't. Um, we have a copy of the um, release note for the core system release plus, uh, which was produced in October 2000, um, and to which you appear to have contributed, is that mm -hmm. right? Um, this document bears the reference FUJ 00119319, please. Um, this document is dated 24th of October of 2000. It's the version 1 of release note for the core system release plus. Um, it provides a definition of the core system release plus for post office counters limited. Um, can you just please briefly explain the purpose of a release note of this type? Um, it's to record and share the contents of the release. So whether that is... Uh, change requests or or pinnacles and CSR plus would have been introducing new functionality I'm sure um, at appendix B um, the note contains a known problem register um, in which known problems in the release and any fixes which have been applied were documented is that correct uh, I'm, I'm sure it's correct. Um, you, you have been provided with a copy of this document, have you not? Yes, I just don't know what particular part. I can, I can look at Appendix B if you like to No, 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 sure. We'll, we'll, we'll pull it up. Um, it's at page 34, please. Um, this is the um, what's known as the known problem register. Yes. Um, it runs from page 34 to page... Uh, 39 and um, I, I'm sure you can help us but I, I think we can see the, the specific pinnacle references in the far left hand column mm -hmm. so their reference numbers and yes. a short summary description in the next column then ICL pathways business impact assessment of the um, pinnacle is that right? Yes. Can you explain the, um, the grading please for that we see A, B and C uh, I don't know, but I can give you a view. I think A would be that it was a major impact, B of lesser impact, and C a low impact. We, th we then see in the next column um, the business impact on, po on the post office network. Um, we see a record of its status on the 10th of October. Um, and in the final column, uh, we see commentaries, including um, whether or not a fix has been applied, whether a fault has been found. Is Yes. You follow that? Yeah. Um, we, of course, don't know um, a great deal about each and every 
one of these pinnacles. Their summary descriptions uh, won't assist us in that regard, but, but we can um, see um, several uh, relating to the EPOS. We see quite a number relating to the EPOS products or identified as such. Do you, do you accept that, having reviewed this document? Yes. Um, if we could scroll down a little bit, please. Um, some of these are rated A, so um, very serious. We see 41673, the CSR Plus EPOS, OW sales report negative volumes, categorised A by ICL pathway, and we can see it's been closed, a fix having been applied. Um, if we go on to the next page, please. You can see a further pinnacle at 45573 relating to office balancing barred. Presumably this another issue in EPOS if it's to do with office balancing. Is that a fair inference? These, of course, could be problems introduced into CSR Plus codes and then found during the testing of the CSR Plus code. Indeed. Yeah. Forgive me, I'm not suggesting... Um, because, of course, this is a release note. This is prior to the release of CSR Plus into the live estate, yes. I assume. Is, is that correct? Yes. Um, so, er, so Pinnacle's discovered during testing, software fixes have been applied, and on the basis of that, uh, the, um, uh, the software is deemed to be fit to, to be released into live estate. Well, that would be the discussion, whether the uh, Pinnacles that aren't fixed, whether that's an acceptable position to go into live. Um, so th there are a number of others. I won't take them through. I won't take you through them all. But um, four seven one three two, the pinnacle is cannot transfer existing transaction. Again, graded A by ICL pathway, medium severity by post office counters, and close following another pinnacle fix. Um, could we scroll down a little bit further, please? Two further pinnacles relating to EPOS and graded high at 48796 uh, and 4 I think the concern would be if there was an A here that wasn't fixed. Well, I think that's precisely the question, isn't it? Because, of course, by applying, repeatedly applying these software fixes, you were creating a risk of generating yet further, product, further faults and defects in the code, were you not? I think that would depend... Oh. I mean, CSR Plus would be enhancing the CSR product and bringing in new functionality that the post office wanted. So these issues could be in the new functionality in the EPOS example that's come in with EPOS as opposed to uh, the, the old product, if you like, the product from CSR. So, I mean, so the problems could come from the development work done for CSR Plus. I think you're saying, is that because it wasn't a stable product in the first place? I don't think you can draw that necessarily from this. But we, we do know that from the emails we've seen, there were quite significant concerns about the number of pinnacles being raised in, in CI4, in CI4 or one yes. of what we believe, one of the releases connected with the CSR Plus. Yeah, I, I, I don't know the positioning of CI4 against CSR Plus. Um, looking back, uh, knowing what we know now, do you consider that um, deciding not to redesign and rewrite EPOS in the face of the advice of ICL Pathways technical experts was the right decision to have made? Uh, so that's, that's a very difficult one to answer. Um, would, would there have been less problems and less work if it had been redesigned and redeveloped? Or would it have created its own problems by starting again? That would be a risk as well. I'm sure that's the kind of decision that people were making, because to start from scratch might introduce its own problems. I think the view at the time was that the problems were in certain areas as opposed to generally across EPOS, and therefore they would concentrate on those areas. Why did you consider that starting again might simply introduce 
more problems? What, what led you to that conclusion? Well, it's just the risk of, of going and, and redeveloping something right from scratch again. But presumably the purpose of doing that was to ensure it was done correctly yes. the next time. Which I, I presume people thought they were doing the first time, but yes. Well, that didn't seem to be borne out by the very high number of pinnacles and the advice of the technical experts yeah. at the time, was it? I think there were, there, were, there were two views, I believe, and the decision was made assessing those two views. Can you help us? What, what do you mean by that there were two views? Because uh, I believe some people thought that it could be fixed in the areas that needed fixing and improving, and others that felt that the whole thing should maybe be rewritten. Um, but you, you've alluded to yet another view, which is that um, that by rewriting it, you might create just as many problems. From, from where did that view stem? Can you help us? Uh, it's just a, a sort of feeling I got from the conversations at the time that w when when Terry was leading on deciding which way to go, those the kind of decisions or discussions that were taking place. Um, I wonder, Mr. Jeremy, if we could return, please, um, to your witness statement at um, WITN 04180100. At some stage, Ms. Hodge, there's probably a need for a break. Um, I'm, I'm guessing, but you choose your moment, all right? Um, so I have two more questions um, for the witness. Oh, well, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Carry on, please. Not at all. I, I propose um, we take a break at that stage. And yeah, yeah, of course. And then course. permit others to ask questions. And Mr Jeremy, you've, you've taken us to um, your evidence at paragraph 15 on page 4, please. I think you accept um, that this paragraph does not give a full account of what you knew at the time mm. of issues relating to EPOS and the cash account. Is that right? Yes. Um, I wonder if you could please explain to me why that is. I had forgotten my involvement in that area. I asked you um, a short time ago um, about um, your reference to formal audits at paragraph 26. Do you mm -hmm. recall that? Yes. Uh, you said that you asked to be given to be shown some of those audits. Yes. Um, was the CSR Plus development audit one of the audits which was shown to you at the time you prepared this statement? I don't think it was. I might be wrong. I don't think it was. There was a, a warehouse audit and something else. I don't remember, sorry. Looking at what you said, um, Mr. Coombs, at, at page, at paragraph 26 um, on page 8, um, under the heading Fitness for Purpose, um, your statement reads ITL Pathway continually reviewed its work to make improvements for future releases. This would have included formal internal audits, um, although I do not recall any of these audits specifically. Internal auditing prior to the national rollout was owned by Martin Bedded, head of quality management, and by his responsible internal audit manager, um, Jan Holmes. Um, this doesn't, does it, give a true and fair reflection um, of your knowledge at the time from the internal audits which were shown to you, does it? At the time... Forgive me, at, at the time being... Um, at the time of your involvement in the Horizon project. True. So I, I knew about the audits when I was on Horizon, yes. This is saying I didn't recall any of them, remembering them as part of the statement, yes. But, and what you're saying, effect, in effect, is that you, you simply had no recollection at the time of writing your witness statement of the very serious concerns that were raised about the accounting integrity uh, and the quality of code and the maintainability 
of the horizon system. Yes. Is that your evidence? Yes. Thank you. I have no further questions. Right. So, sorry for the interruption. Um, so we we do we have questions from other legal representatives? Sir, I have um, one question. It's probably going to take about three minutes if that assists. And Ms. Page. There may be slightly more than that from me, if I can just have a few minutes to have a look at my... Well, I tell you, can I address um, you, Mr. Jerram? Would you prefer to have a short break now and allow everybody to gather their thoughts, or would you prefer to carry on until the end, on the assumption that we, the end is no more than about 10 minutes away? I'm going to asked Miss Page, I think she would refer to me to have a break so she could, no? Yes, no, that's fine. Well, then, then can we continue, please? Fine. Well, then let's, let's go to the end, then. Good afternoon, Mr. Jerram. I um, ask questions on behalf of um, 153 um, core participants um, who are, and I'm, who are sub-postmasters, and I'm instructed by How & Co. Um, can we turn to um, paragraph 16 of your statement? Um, that's WIT N04 180100. Um, and this is, um, yes, paragraph 1616, um, which is on page four of nine. And this is in relation to um, cash account. And you say that prior to Horizon, sub-postmasters used a paper accounting system. You say that post office took a decision which wasn't taken quickly, that there should be no paper cash account. Is that right? Yes. Um, now, the effect of this decision is that sub-postmasters uh, were prevented from checking their records against allegations of shortfalls. They didn't have the paper. Yes system, and the Horizon system didn't permit them to do that. Um, the question I have for you is, was there any discussion between you as uh, development and later program director and post office on this issue? No. Um, were you aware of the issue at the time? The issue of... That, um, uh, that the ability of sub-postmasters to have records that they could check and interrogate was going to be taken away from them in the Horizon system. No. Okay. I, I'm asking you these questions because you've referred to it in your of course. statement. Um, the final question then and I, um, is, is, do you agree um, from what you've said about the post office decision making process and that this decision was a decision that post office made, that the ability of sub postmasters to check their records was deliberately um, designed out of the Horizon system? Yes, I, <clears throat> obviously in moving to an automated system at some point you'd move away from, from, from the paper side and I think the papers had to be sent in to TIP and TIP had to process them and or whatever. But yes, that, that decision took that away. Okay, well thank you. I don't have any further, further um, questions for you unless I'm asked to ask you anything else. No, I'm not. Thank you. Okay. Your, uh, sorry, Flora Page representing a number of the sub-postmasters. Um, you became programme director in 2001. Yeah, the end of 2001, when Mike Coombs, unfortunately, was taken ill. So, presumably, that meant there wasn't much of a crossover. No. But you knew the, the programme pretty well already, didn't you? Yes. And when you took over, what was the line of report between you and the uh, SSC? SSC? Yes. That's... Third line support. management. Sorry? So in service management? Third line support. Okay. Uh, none. So how would you have had any control over what they did? I, I wouldn't have had. You wouldn't have had? Why not? Because they're managing the live estate. The, the programme is managing future change, not, not what's in live estate. So, so I don't think service management reported to the programme director. So how would problems in the live estate get communicated to your program? Through the raising of pinnacles. And how would your program come to know about pinnacles? So they would have been routed 
uh, my team, the development team, would have been fourth line. So when there was something that uh, was felt by first, second, third that it required an investigation and maybe a change into software, then that would be routed through to the development teams. So the fourth line were under your command, as it were? Yes. And who was, who was that person? Who was the link? Who would have reported to you from fourth line? Uh, okay. Um, when I was program director, so, so the development director would have managed the development teams, and there'd have been a number of those different teams, and they'd have had resolution groups. So the pinnacles would have been sent to those different resolution groups. Right, but uh, how would you have ensured that problems that were arising in the live estate didn't continue into the future programme? So, following the route, let's say the problem raised through live through post office, investigation from third line believes it's a software fault, that goes to a fourth line team to resolve, um, which would be a resolution into the live estate. And we used to do something uh, called a, a clone. They would then clone that pinnacle, a copy of that pinnacle, into the version of software they were then working on for the next release. So the fix would be applied into both. You knew, didn't you, that throughout the year 2000, Acceptance Incident 376 had been a live issue, something that needed to be continued to monitor. Yes. So uh, what did you do to ensure that the program going forward would be alert to and able to continue to monitor what was going on with cash accounts, reconciliations, AI 376 generally? I think that would have been through the instance that came from the live service. So the, the, the route that you've just described? Yes. And are you aware of that working? I mean, can you be sure that AI376 continued to be monitored and fed through to your team for the future? I, I believe the process worked. What makes you say that? I mean, if there, if there was... Bigger problems than just a flow of pinnacles in the live estate. I expect that to have been dis brought to the attention of the management team that I was then part of via the service director. Given what we know now and the fact that there were continuing problems, how can you be confident that uh, this was working? I don't know how I can be confident. Um, that was the process we had in place that we believe worked. Were you in any way involved with uh, making sure that if Pockle wanted to pursue Postmasters, uh, audit trails were made available to them? No. And who, in 2001, when you took over, who do you think would have been? It would have been managed by the service group. And who was that? They were under uh, Steve McCow. Thank you. Is that it, Ms. Page? Those are my questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you. That's it, Ms. Hodge? That's right, sir. Thank you. The witness can be released. And that so thank you very much, Mr. Jerram, for coming to the inquiry to answer all the questions put to you. Um, and as I've said, we'll now adjourn these hearings until 10 o'clock on Tuesday. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon.